All right, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us here for the Buzz on Pollinators with Dr. Nate from MSU Extension. Good evening, Dr. Nate. Hi. Thank you for joining us. Um, he is going to talk to us about the Buzz on Pollinators. Um, we're really excited to have you here and thank you for giving us your time tonight. And if anybody has any questions for Dr. Nate at the end of the presentation, I encourage you to type them in the chat and then I will make sure to read them back to him at the end. Sound like a plan? Okay, all right, take it away, Dr. Nate. Okay, thanks so much. Yeah, of course. This is uh, gonna be really fun. I'm glad um, you could join us this evening. I am gonna talk about pollinators and some other kinds of insects just a little bit. So um, my name is Nate Walton. I am a doctor of entomology. So it doesn't mean that I, I don't take care of bugs like a medical doctor would, uh, but I do know a lot about insects. And uh, I'm going to talk about just a few insects tonight, but hopefully um, you know, inspire you all to ask me lots of questions. There'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. And focusing on pollinators tonight, pollinators are really important insects and it is Earth Week. Pollinators are important for lots of reasons, but one of those, uh, several of those reasons are, are related to keeping our environment healthy. And so definitely a good topic for Earth Week. Uh, and coming up in June though, is pollinator week. So you can that's another exciting week. So keep your eyes peeled during June for special programming that we'll be doing around pollinators. And uh, I'm gonna show you a quick video that I made just a few months ago. <clears throat> and it is, it is about apple pollination. And I think it's a really great way uh, to help you understand what pollination is so we can then understand what pollinators are. And, I want you to uh, pay extra close attention at the beginning of this video. There's going to be a short sequence where bees are buzzing around on apple flowers. And your task during that sequence is going to be to count how many different kinds of bees you can see. OK, so get ready to count bees while we watch this video. Hi, I'm Nate Walton with MSU Extension, and I'm an entomologist, which means that I study insects like bees and other pollinators. And I'm going to talk to you today how about how bees help us to make apples. Time to count bees. In order for an apple flower to make an to become an apple, it needs to be pollinated. So these flowers here have showing some pollen. And that's represented by these orange and yellow circles. In order for that flower to become an apple, it needs to receive pollen from another flower. And the way they get that pollen is by insects moving it from flower to flower like these bees. So once that bee moves pollen from one flower to the other, each of those flowers, now that it has some pollen, will be able to become a fruit like an apple. The bees don't do this to get apples. Bees don't eat apples. They actually eat pollen and nectar on these flowers. They get that uh, pollen because it has protein in it. They need that protein to feed to their young baby bees. And those young bees are going to use that protein uh, to grow their bodies into larger, uh, fully adult bees. And then they're going to be able to fly around and do pollination themselves once they have eaten all that pollen. The other thing that bees get from flowers is nectar, and that's a, a watery substance that's produced by the flowers that has carbohydrates in it, and they use those carbohydrates to get the energy they need to fly around from flower to flower. 
Another interesting thing about apples is they actually need something called cross-pollination, and that means they need to get the pollen not just from another flower, but from another flower on a different tree of a different apple variety. So for example, we have this gala apple here on the left, and if you had a gala apple tree in your schoolyard, it would need to get pollen from a different kind of apple tree, such as this Golden Delicious. And that apple tree wouldn't have to be really close. Uh, it could be a hundred, several hundred feet away. It could be miles away. Because bees are really good at moving that pollen from tree to tree. And once the bees do that, once they move that pollen uh, to those flowers on the other trees, those flowers are then able to develop into delicious apple fruits for us to eat. Okay, well, I hope you all enjoyed that. Uh, you might have noticed there were a lot of bees in that video, and uh, we're going to have some more bees to look at here in just a moment. So first, before I start getting back into talking about pollinators, I want to talk about some basics about what makes an insect an insect. Most of our pollinators are insects. Uh, so let's talk about what makes an insect an insect. Insects can look like a lot of different things. You know, we call them worms, we call them caterpillars, we call them grubs, we call them bees or wasps or flies or gnats or those things that are buzzing around us and, and irritating us. Uh, and those are all, those all can be insects, okay? And it, you know, some of them, and not everything that looks like a worm is, a, is actually an insect. Some of them are different kind of organisms. So. Uh, I want to talk about here what makes an insect an insect. So insects belong to another group called arthropods, and arthropods are just all of the things that you might come across, uh, creepy crawlies that have a crunchy outside. So things like centipedes, spiders, even lobsters and shrimp and those crustaceans are in the group arthropods. And what makes them all the same is that they all have that crunchy their skeleton is on the outside of their body instead of on the inside. We all have bones on the inside of our bodies. These kinds of organisms have bones on the outside instead of on the inside. That's what makes them crunchy on the outside. And insects are in that group too, but they're different from those other ones. Just a minute, I seem to be having uh, issues with Microsoft PowerPoint. We'll be right back in just a moment. Sorry about that. Okay, so insects are arthropods, but they're just a little bit different from the other ones. Okay, they have these legs that are jointed and they only have six legs. And that's what sets insects apart from other, other organisms that might look like them are those six legs. They always have wings uh, as adults and they have four wings. Okay, so look for those four wings. Sometimes they're hard to see on like a beetle like this one. They cover them up so you can't see them all the time. But they usually have four wings and they have a segmented body. And that's really important. And three body regions. We call it the head on this wasp. Here's the head. The thorax is the part where the wings are attached. And then the abdomen are the three body regions. And all insects have those. All insects have some segmentation on their bodies. So I wanna play a quick little game here called is it an insect and um, you don't have, you can kind of play at home I'm just gonna go through these uh, each of these images and we're gonna see if it's an insect or not okay here's one is it an insect what do you think how many legs does it have yes this is an insect it has six legs four wings, although they're covered up. 
uh, but three body regions and it's got segments on its body. What about this? Is it an insect? It's awfully cute, but no, it only has four legs, uh, no wings, and no segments on its body. It's definitely not an insect. What about this one? It's a cool spider called a garden archaeopi. And it's not an insect because it has eight legs, of course. Uh, it, spiders also have these two body regions instead of three. They've got like a head area and an abdomen. What about this? Looks kind of like a snake. But if we zoom out, this is actually a butterfly. And it's definitely an insect, okay? It has six legs, four wings, and three body regions. So I hope you all were playing at home and, and getting that right. Another thing about insects is they go through metamorphosis, okay? That means their body changes through their life quite a bit. Um, they might go, uh, they, they shed their exoskeleton. This image is showing a leaf hopper right after it shed its exoskeleton. You can see here, this was its skeleton before it took it off, it came out, and now it's kind of soft. It's got a little time period here where it's gonna puff up its body and grow a little bit more. And then its exoskeleton is gonna harden uh, from contact with the air and it'll be safe to go hopping around again. So some insects go through just a little bit of change every time they grow, but other ones go through big changes. So this is a lady beetle as a, as a young lady beetle. So the immature version of it, kid version of a lady, ladybug looks like this thing. It's all spiky. Uh, they're really cool. They run around and eat other insects. And then when it grows up, become an adult, it turns into what you are used to seeing out there and calling a lady beetle. But other insects, they go through a more gradual change as they grow. They don't, they don't change their whole body around. And those insects uh, are, are um, kind of interesting. So they don't change their body around as much. They eat the same thing when they're young. So the kids, like this is a milkweed bug. As kids, they eat milkweed. As grownups, they also eat milkweed. Okay, but not all insects are like that. A lot of them change their body around completely like this lady beetle and like butterflies. Okay, butterflies start out as you may already know as caterpillars. So the immature stage of a butterfly is a caterpillar. They eat a lot of food. And what do they eat when they're caterpillars? Well, they eat a lot of leaves, okay? When they uh, have a chewing mouth part, they chew up those leaves to eat them. When they grow up, their mouth part changes and then it's more like a straw. They can't chew anything as an adult, as a butterfly. And so they drink all their food. Here's a little video of one doing that. They've got this straw-like mouth part. Get nectar from those flowers. One of our favorite butterflies, of course, is the monarch butterfly. Uh, this is the grown-up butterfly here. When they're younger, they look, of course, like caterpillars. And, you know, they only eat milkweed. Milkweed's plants are really important for monarchs. So if you've got milkweed in your yards, uh, if you have a garden where you, where you have some milkweed, leave it be or plant some more is what I would say. It's a great plant to have around. It produces flowers that bees and other pollinators like. And then the monarch larvae are able to eat the leaves. This one here, as you can see, is kind of dangling from the leaf. It is getting ready to make a cocoon or a chrysalis here where it's gonna pupate. And that's the process where they change their body around. They come out of the chrysalis here as an adult butterfly. This is one of my favorite pollinators uh, that I discovered. Well, I didn't discover it, but I, for myself, I found out it, it was around in my yard last year. And it's a little beetle. And when we think of pollinators, we usually think about bees and butterflies. But the fact is that there are lots of other insects that are pollinators like this beetle. And this beetle is not eating the, eating the flower. It's, it's visiting the flower. It's, it's getting pollen from the flower, just like a bee might be doing. And um, in addition to that, they're, they're fuzzy. They kind of look like bumblebees, don't they? Uh, and they've got a little face on their rear end, which I think is really funny. And these are called scarab flower beetles. Keep an eye out for them this spring. 
Another great pollinator are these leafcutter bees. So leafcutter bees, uh, Hello, everybody. My apologies. It looks like Dr. Nate is having some connectivity issues. So we will give it a few minutes to see if he um, is able to rejoin the meeting and begin to screen share again. Um, thank you for your patience. And let's see if he is able to get back online. Again, if you are watching and you do have any questions you'd like to ask Dr. Nate, I encourage you to leave them in the chat box over there on the side and later when he's done giving his presentation, um, I will be able to read the questions that you all have written to him and he can give answers. Okay, let's see if Dr. Nate is able to join us. Hmm. If you're watching, thanks for hanging in there. <laughs> uh, Dr. Nay, our, our presenter is having some internet issues. So we're just going to wait and hang out here a few more minutes to see if he's able to rejoin the meeting um, and continue with his presentation. Um, we were really excited to have Dr. Nate join us this week. Um, he's from MSU Extension and since it is Earth Day on Thursday, we figured it might be kind of nice to have a program about pollinators. And then later in the week, we're going to be having uh, one of Nate's coworkers, Roberta Franz. Oh, hi, hi. Doc. Yeah, <laughs> no, unplanned intermission there. I'm sorry about that. Uh, my okay. computer was... just computer just turned off. I was just sharing how um, you're giving this presentation this evening, and then one of your coworkers. Um, Rebecca Kranz is going to be giving a gardening um, Zoom presentation on Earth Day, which is Thursday in the afternoon. So if you're interested cool. in learning yeah. about gardening in your zone, you can check that out on Thursday. <laughs> All right, I will let you totally. get back to the presentation. <laughs> Great, okay, so here we go. Leaf cutter bees are, um, they're fuzzy on the bottom. So on their abdomen there, underside of their abdomen, they are really fuzzy and that's where they pick up all the pollen. And so sometimes you'll see them flying around and they're all orange. They look like a, like a little cheesy puff flying through the air. And um, what they're, the thing that makes them called leaf cutter bees is that they have this uh, habit of cutting little circles out of leaves. You can see here, they've done it on this leaf and they use that to make their nest. And so um, any of you who may have seen out, uh, there's some bee hotels out there, or maybe you have one in your own backyard where you make a little habitat for bees to build nests in. Leafcutter bees are one of the types of bees that you'll see in those bee hotels. And they take those leaf uh, discs that they cut out, they make them up into a little part of their nest and they keep their uh, pollen and they, and they lay eggs that are gonna become grown up leafcutter bees. Bumblebees are, one of my favorite pollinators. Uh, and you know, these are out right now. This video was taken yesterday. This is a flowering almond in a subdivision across the road from my house. And um, these are queen bees that you see right now. If you see a big fuzzy bumblebee flying around, it's a queen and she spent the winter, uh, you know, under leaves or something over the winter, uh, staying warm all by herself. And then in the spring, she comes out and she drinks all this nectar. She gathers a whole bunch of pollen and she finds a place to build a home. And a place she might decide to build a home would be uh, in a hole in the ground, maybe that, that a chipmunk made or some other kind of a rodent dug a hole 
and left it there for the bumblebee to use. And so the bumblebee is gonna move in there, make her home and uh, start laying eggs and she'll put pollen and nectar in there for, the, for young bees to eat. Uh, and then eventually th those bees are gonna grow up and be bumblebees themselves. And then they start to help. And she has this whole colony of worker bees that help her out um, throughout the whole summer. So later in the summer, when you see bumblebees, they'll actually be smaller, uh, but more or less the same color, yellow and black and really fuzzy. And um, those are the worker bumblebees. Really neat insects to look out for this summer. Now, I think this is my last favorite pollinator to talk about. These are hawk moths. Um, there are a few different kinds that we have in Michigan. This movie is slowed down about, well, now it's slowed down to about half speed. But these uh, moths move, they're moving so fast that they're just a blur and you can kind of hear them going brrr. Uh, <laughs> they get the name hummingbird hawk moth because of that, the way they actually seem like a hummingbird more than like an insect. And and they're really great pollinators, okay? You can see those so moving from flower to flower. It's got kind of a fuzzy body like most moths do. And it's gonna pick up pollen as it's visiting these flowers. You can see it's proboscis there, uh, getting nectar from the flowers. They're really great flyers. And when we think about pollinators, uh, we think about butterflies, right? A lot of the time, but actually moths are really important pollinators. They're not as colorful as butterflies, right? But they are really important actually to plants and for pollination. Um, most of the pollination that moths do uh, is also goes unseen because we don't see moths as much. They're more active in the evening, uh, at dusk, or even at night. So, um, you know, important pollinators to remember are these moths and keep an eye out for these hawk moths this summer. You might see them uh, visiting some flowers. Uh, oh, final one to talk about is the green lacewing. And this is something that uh, visits flowers a lot and they're really cool, really delicate green insects. Kind of hard to see, um, but keep your eyes out for them. When they're young, okay, this is a, a, a young green lacewing, an immature version of one before they're all grown up and, and get these wings. And uh, they're not, not very good looking, are they? But they're kind of cool. They eat a lot of other insects. Actually, they eat pests. Like this is an aphid. If you don't know what an aphid is, um, keep an eye out for, for them. They do like to suck on our garden plants. They, they're a uh, pest insect and lacewings can help us by eating them. So that's a good thing. This is a lacewing egg. So when the, when the adult lacewing lays an egg, uh, she puts it on a little stalk it's like a thread. And then up here at the end of that thread is the egg where it's safe from being eaten by other insects. Uh, the little baby lacewing will hatch out of there and crawl down and start looking for food right away. Okay, one last fun little thing for y'all to do. This is a tree cricket. So um, this one does visit flowers, not much of a pollinator, but I couldn't resist adding it to my presentation tonight because I want to tell you about these insects. And they're in the summertime, you'll hear them. You might not know that they're there. You might not have known that they were there, but listen at night for this sound. Okay, listen at night for this sound. And, okay, that's a really regular chirping that you'll hear from these tree crickets. And if you count the, the chirps that happen over 15 seconds, uh, you will be able to estimate the temperature of the outside air because they chirp faster when it's warmer out and they chirp slower when it's colder out. So if you hear these crickets this summer, uh, wait for 15 seconds, count, and we can use a timer, a stopwatch, or um, maybe a, a, a somebody has a cell phone, they can use the time here 15 seconds and count all the chirps that you hear, add the number 40 to those chirps, and that will tell you the air temperature. You don't even need a thermometer. You can just listen for chirps and, oops, and count them, okay? Uh, and that'll be this summer you'll hear them. So listen for that tree cricket. Okay, that's, that's it for my presentation. I hope we have some questions to answer. 
Uh, thank you again for zooming in for the buzz about bugs or buzz about pollinators. Hi, Dr. Nate. Hi. <laughs> Thanks again for uh, giving that wonderful presentation. I find the tree crickets incredibly fascinating. I did not know that they could uh, share the air temperature with us. That's mm -hmm. really cool. Um, we did have one question come in um, from Marianne. She had a question. Um, she wonders if a rose systemic will affect pollinators. Oh, is that a... Uh, uh, she gave the ingredients. Is that helpful? Oh, sure. Um, I do not know if I'm going to say this correctly, so bear with me. <laughs> uh, tebuconazole, imidacloprid, and mm -hmm. clothandin. Okay. Um, yeah, so at least one of those is an insecticide um, that, that we know, uh, imidacloprid, the active ingredient. Um, you know, it, it is toxic, of course, to insects because it, that's the purpose of it is to kill insects as an insecticide. Um, and it's systemic. So systemic meaning that it, when it's applied to the soil, it, the plants draw it up into their, through the roots and into the plant. And so, uh, as, as you can imagine, that, that protects the plant because it now has that product that chemical in its tissues. And so if anything eats the plant, it'll ingest that insecticide and um, it won't do so well. So unfortunately, those products also make it their way into the flowers. So yes, it can be quite uh, dangerous to our pollinators when a plant is treated with one of those products uh, close to bloom time. So, um, you know, if, if you want to use something like that, that's systemic insecticide, uh, it's better to wait until after the plant is done blooming um, or to cut off the flowers after you apply the insecticide. Um, if you're doing it with roses, you obviously don't want to remove all the flowers. Your whole point of growing the rose bush is for the flowers. So uh, that's a really tough situation. I, I, I um, you know, I, I can't really offer you much advice right, right now, but um, certainly uh, there are ways that you can work around that. To still protect your plants, but not hurt pollinators. Are there any product alternatives? Well, it really depends on what the pest is. You know, I think uh, we teach uh, pest management, uh, integrated pest management, right? And that's really targeted to the the pest, you know? So it's, okay. uh, you know, we choose a product based on what the pest is. And so I'd have to know. Uh, Marianne, if you want to chime in what pest you're dealing with, I can tell Dr. Nate. <laughs> Um, I was just curious to know how you how you got into your field of study. Oh boy, I uh, you know I had a really great teacher uh, in college who was really excited about insects, and um, and really um, got me excited about them too. And I, I tromping around in streams looking for bugs and stuff. So. You know, uh, then I started to realize how important they are for our food supply. You know, but we need pollinators to help make food. But we also need other beneficial insects to help control the pest insects. And so um, that's when I really uh, kind of got serious about it and decided to pursue um, that's, a career. That's really interesting. Uh, Mary Ann, she says that she's dealing with aphids. Ah, I see. Yeah. You know, insecticidal soap is a really great... Uh, lower lower impact product to use. Um, so look for something that's an insecticidal soap to spray on the on the aphids. Mm -hmm. And J, J beetles? Yeah, Japanese beetles are a tough one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are. We <laughs> that, uh, you know, uh, Marianne, I, I think um, that's a long answer. So I think, um, you know, simple things you can do, and I don't, not everybody can do this, but if you can put a a, a kind of a mesh protecting, you know, cover over your rose bushes during the time that Japanese beetles are active. Um, that's a great way to do it without using uh, insecticides. Okay, let's see. We just had a question come in, and someone is wondering how does a bumblebee pollinate? Yeah, bumblebees. Um, 
you know, like any really any insect that's fuzzy, uh, there's a leaf cutter bee in the picture right here. Um, but bumblebees are also covered in hair. A lot of bees are covered in hair. And it's really just the fact that they're on the flower getting, uh, getting the nectar of the pollen that they need for themselves, but their hair attracts the pollen. The pollen is actually like a static charge there. And the pollen actually kind of attaches itself to the hairs on the bodies of not just bees, but flies and, and moths. Um, bees are better at it because they're fuzzier. And so that's why bumblebees are such great pollinators. So they, they get it on their body and the next time they visit a flower, they rub their body you know, up against different flower parts and that, that's how you get successful pollination. It's just that uh, simple. It's not, um, they don't intentionally place the pollen on the flower or anything like that. It's just, they get, they get pollen all over themselves and then they <laughs> spread it around. And they spread it around. That's cool. Yeah. And they carry it around while they fly. Um, mm -hmm. If someone wanted to have a pollinator friendly garden, can you recommend some easy plants that they could consider planting to welcome pollinators? Oh yeah, lots. I don't even know where to start. Um, <laughs> but uh, we have a, some great advice on our pollinators. Our, our, we have a couple of websites. I'll put them in the chat. Um, okay. We have a Gardening in Michigan, which is migarden.msu.edu. Okay. okay. And there's a smart gardening section there. There's a pollinator section there. Um, and then pollinators.msu.edu is a really great uh, pollinator focused site where they have lists of plants um, that you can look at. Um, really anything that flowers, um, a lot of the, you know, sometimes there might be things already grown in your yard that that's great for pollinators. Um, and sometimes I just tell people maybe just instead of looking for things to plant, try to, you know, encourage the things that are already growing there in your yard. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, I know we, when we moved into our house, there was a pretty established garden bed already going. So that's what we've kind of been trying to do. Um, I did have one question too about the bee hotels. Are those something that anyone could make for any size backyard or is it kind of, you know, if you have a certain amount of yard space and adequate amount of uh, flowers and such in your yard? Yeah, anyone can, you certainly uh, can put one in their yard. Um, the, the, the only thing I would worry about is, is that some of them are not constructed really in a way that's actually uh, good for the bees. So there are some size issues with those that they need to be a certain size and a, especially the depth of them. So I see some on store shelves that are really shallow. You know, they just have about a two, two inch profile off the wall. And that's really not gonna provide enough space for bees to build a good nest in. Bees need at least six inches. So that would be one that you can certainly go uh, eat, put them in your yard. It might take a couple of years for the bees to find it, especially if you're in a place that's maybe not close by to like a lot of flowering plants, okay. but, um, they should move in, you know, and um, just make sure it's one that's that's well made and and that is really providing good nesting habitat for those bees. Okay, so more than six inches is that what you said? At least six inches At deep. Least six yeah. inches deep. Okay, that's great advice for those of us who are interested, maybe in welcoming bees, but don't exactly like me, but don't exactly know how. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I'm not seeing any other new questions. Um, so I want to thank you for your time and presenting to us some pollinators tonight. That was really wonderful. And I know that we all appreciate it. Great. And uh, glad, to, glad to join you. And, you know, I'd love to come back anytime. And uh, again, look, uh, I hope that Becca Kranz, uh, is it on Wednesday that she's doing the... Um, on Thursday, she's Thursday. doing a presentation on gardening in our zone. So, great. and she's a master gardener, I believe. So she will have lots of great tips and people can come and bring their gardening questions. And yeah, it, it should be a lovely time as well. Cool. Well, thanks again. I hope you have a great evening. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.